<laughs> so I was saying last week, what, what can I do for you? I thought you were coming here to hit me with those or something. I was talking last week about how I was probably going to talk in Mark for a while, since there's a lot of cool stuff there, and I am going to talk on Mark. So I'm going to pick up right after the stuff we were talking about last week, where um, uh, Jesus was, was baptized and he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he went out the temptation with the devil and blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. Um, immediately after that, in the Gospel of Mark, the section says, now after John was put in prison, I had a cough drop in my mouth, that's why I sound so funny. After John, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So the central theme throughout basically the first three chapters of Mark is the theme of the authority of Jesus and the opposition that it provokes. And that idea of opposition that it provokes isn't always a good thing to understand. Like, there's never going to be a day that's going to come where people are going to like, oh, 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 you're in the church, you're a Christian, we all respect you now, and everything's going to be easy. And that's, that's a dream, man. That's, that's not this world. It's a, it's a life of struggle. It's a life of suffering. It's a life of unspeakable joy and unspeakable peace. But it's just not a cakewalk like that. It's not going to happen. Um, so the opposition in the Gospel of Mark it comes first from demons and then it comes from religious leaders, which emphasizes exactly where the battle lines are drawn for the spiritual struggle that's ahead in Jesus' ministry and in our ministry, and I walk following him. So uh, the first verse here, verse 14, now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. The phrase gospel of the kingdom of God is not in the best Greek text. Uh, it doesn't take anything away from the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God was a central message that Jesus taught. He talked about it all the time, talks about it in the next verse. Just in this verse, that is just not what the Greek says. Um, the Greek says the gospel of God. Most of you know gospel means good news. So it's talking about the good news of God. Now for anyone that cares about such things, that is in the subjective genitive and the objective genitive at the same time in the what? Greek. <laughs> so what that means for us is that God is both the source of the good news and the object of the good news. It means it's from God and it's about God. So why is it good news, man? The things that, that we, we've hit over and over and over again in the past couple months, these ideas of, of hope, of forgiveness, of restoration, of new life, in Christ. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, in chapter 5, verse 17, he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, remember when we were going through Ephesians, that phrase, in Christ, was coming up all over the place, right? If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And uh, that, that new life in the Greek is specifically mentions a new quality of life. And, and that the, the old things fall away where there wasn't that quality, where there wasn't purpose, where there wasn't meaning and there wasn't substance. And if you look back to the verse before that, in verse 16, he says, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. And he says, Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, Yet now we know him thus no longer. What that means, according to the flesh, is talking about uh, worldly systems, human thought processes. He's saying we don't look at people just based on outward appearance. We don't look at them just strictly with our physical human mind. And he said we, look, we looked at Christ at this way at one point. Paul was fiercely opposed to Christ at one point. And he said we looked at him with just this limited human understanding at one point. But we don't look at him like that anymore. And we don't look at people like that anymore. So this indicates that the principal area of change that goes on in us in his new life in Christ is one of attitude towards Christ and towards other people. So when we have our hearts and our minds filled with things from God, we're restructured and we're rewired, where the entire fabric of our life changes, the, the, our thinking, our feeling, our, our will, our willingness, our desires, our actions. We're under new management, dude. And we have different priorities that come with this new life in Christ. The old priorities just fade away. Like I, the, my priority list in my life following Christ of, of ripping a bomb and watching cartoons is pretty low on my priority list, man. It doesn't come up in my thoughts anymore. Without Christ, I wake up and I'm like, oh my gosh, bro, put on the Cartoon Network and let's smoke some weed, man. This is the best part of the day. Completely different priorities following Christ in my life. It's like the, the, the desire is just not there. I never made a conscious choice to stop smoking weed. Getting sober... Leaving alcohol behind, leaving hard drugs behind was a very conscious choice, and it destroyed my life more than I could ever tell you. But stopping smoking weed 
It was just something that I, one day I was like, I'm so weed in like a year. It's just the desire wasn't there anymore. Different priorities, man. So back in Mark, Jesus says, don't smoke weed in the last now. Jesus says, <laughs> <laughs> he says he's coming, he's preaching his gospel, his good news of God, and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So he says the time is fulfilled. Jesus evaluates and witnesses to God's action for our salvation, right? There's good news, there's new life, there's hope. He witnesses to that by saying the time is now. That sound familiar, Julie? <laughs> he says the time is now. He doesn't say the time is, is tomorrow. He doesn't say the time is when work is less stressful. He doesn't say the time is when after your kids have gone to bed and things are a little bit calmer. He says the time is now, man. There is no waiting. It's this time. And in Galatians chapter 4, it is verse 4 too. Um, Galatians is another letter that Paul wrote. And this idea of the time being now, the time fulfilled, he says, but when, when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, which is Aramaic for father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So there's this idea, the time is now. We start following Jesus to with him become an heir, to become a son of God. The heir has the, the same rights and privileges as the son does. Jesus is the son, right? So this idea of these rights and these privileges is something that's going to keep coming up over and over through the gospel of Mark. It's this idea of this authority. The heir has authority of the one who's the heir to. The heir to a king has all the authority of the king. You know, he's given that respect because he holds the authority of the king. If you look at authority up in the dictionary, Authority is going around all over the place. We talk about the authority of Christ. And it's really not, I've never explained very well what that means. And I can't explain very well what that means in the next 15 minutes. It's going to take a lot longer than that, but I can start to. Authority, you look it up in the dictionary, and you'll see a lot of different definitions. And the one that, that we're looking for, and the, the one that's context is, is power to influence or command thought and behavior. Convincing force. And the Greek definition is ability or strength in someone. The right to exercise power. So in Christ, following Christ, living life, actually following him, not just knowing it as a fact, actually living it, we have the same right to do what he did. He exercised that same kind of power. Get into that more. I said, I said probably in the next couple of weeks we'll get into that more so it makes more sense. But let that just start seeking it now because that's a deep concept, man. It's difficult to comprehend. Um, so it comes, he says, the time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Jesus' actions, God's rule invaded the world. It's present with people. The kingdom of God is God's rule. God's rule is present through what Jesus did. Jesus said, as my Father sent me, so I send you. We're given the same command to go out, to live the same way. That means our actions are to bring an invasion of God's rule. So what actions? What actions are we supposed to do? The actions we see Jesus doing, man. That's why we have this. Not to sit on our shelves and collect dust and point to it when we feel legalistic and like we want to show someone they're wrong, man. This is how we live life. It's talking about driving out demons. It's talking about healing. It's talking about restoration, acts of love, mercy, kindness, forgiveness. His disciples, which is us, right? People following Jesus are his disciples. We do those things through his authority, through his right to exercise that power. And he says, repent and believe in the gospel. The appropriate response to God's rule, to God's presence, is to repent and believe. Repent speaks of a complete 180 degree change of mind that leads to change actions. And believe. I mean, believing isn't knowing. Man, and James says, even the demons believe there is one God. And it's true. You know, that's, you believe in God? Good, that's a good start. Even the demons believe in God, man. But they don't live it out. They don't live their life like that as a present reality. Um, God's rule and God's reign, his kingdom, right? It doesn't operate in a void. It, it assumes a people, people subject to that rule. If there is God's rule, there has to be people subject to that rule. Well, there is no kingdom. It operates in a void. Which means it involves the formation of a community. And that's the next thing that Jesus does is he starts to put together this community. Well, I love about Jesus calling these dudes to, to, to start this ministry 
the only thing that's ever changed the world. He, the recipients of Jesus' call are extremely unexceptional. The kingdom of God doesn't come with a, a red carpet and strippers swinging around on poles and people yelling and screaming. It doesn't come with any kind of fanfare, man. It comes through the gradual gathering of a group of socially insignificant people, just everyday people, in an unnoticed corner of an everyday little town. That's how the kingdom of God comes in. Tell me that is not a picture of us standing here in this room right now, man. <laughs> so Jesus says, um, and he walked by the Sea of Galilee. He saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishing. Then Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Now, Sunday school, we like to use this picture of fishermen becoming fishers of men, and this wordplay that was there, and it's a cool picture to teach kids it is, but it's not there in the Greek. That's just the way it translates into English. Um, thing is, Jesus says to these guys, he says, follow me. Follow me is a call to discipleship. It's a relationship of loyalty to a master teacher, and it's completely against the, the common rabbi relationships, teacher relationship that was going on in the day. Students would go and seek out the teacher they wanted to follow, and that teacher would then decide if they were going to take them in, and then they would teach them the law, the Old Testament commandments, and they would live legalistically. Everything was about outward appearance. There was no change in the heart whatsoever. It was why Jesus had a problem with it. This, this is, is the teacher going out and saying, look, come with me, and I'm going to show you what's up. I'm going to show you what's real. Um... What's cool is she says, and I will make you become fishers of men. Make you become is a phrase in the Greek that indicates a long, slow process. Like we were talking about last week, that, that attitude of, of commitment for the long haul, of focusing on, on the ultimate destination one step at a time, one row of that boat at a time. Uh, Jesus is straight up saying, like, this isn't going to be an instantaneous process when he uses this phrase. He's saying to these dudes, look, come follow me. And it's going to be a long process, it's going to be a slow process, it's not going to be simple, it's not going to be easy, it's not going to be effortless, it's not going to be without pain. But I'm going to change you into something new. He's going to make them these fishers of men, these soul winners, these men who change the world. Verse 18 says, they immediately left their nets and followed him. Immediately has this, the, the, the idea in the Greek very much English like it does not once. The thing is, the picture it makes is that Jesus' authority provokes immediate obedience. Now, hey, hang on, I'm going to come with you in a minute. Or like, let me, let me finish catching my fish for the day so I've got something to eat and I'm going to follow you. And let me go take care of my stuff. And Jesus calls, and these dudes go immediately because of the authority that he had. They were like, this, this is legit. Like, we're going with this dude right now, right? So it says immediately, they left their nets. Left is a pretty insignificant word to us, but in the Greek it implies a separation. And again, the technical, the technical meaning of this is that it is a participle in the aorist tense. No one cares about that. Anyways, then what that means to us is it speaks of a once and for all action. Look, would you just fall out of your chair? My gosh, so I need to be more careful. <laughs> the idea is it speaks of a once and for all action. And it means that they made a complete and permanent break from their former lives. They gave all of themselves. They didn't say, we're gonna leave and follow you right now, but we're still gonna like come back and fish your food in once in a while. Like, you know, we're still gonna see these girls on the side or still hang, just like, let me roll up a blunt to bring with me for the road because I don't know where this is gonna go. You know, they give all of themselves immediately to him. They, they can make a complete and permanent break from their former lives to embrace the new life, the new quality of life. Um, but follow him. Immediately they left and followed him. Follow him, the Greek implies fellowship, it implies joint participation. Uh, the picture it makes is one of walking side by side with another person. And the definition is to join one as a disciple, to cleave steadfastly to one, conform wholly to his example in living, in living, and if need be, in dying. And it's, uh, this is a, this, uh, a great picture that we, we miss in English. The, the picture is an attachment to the person of Jesus. Personal surrender to his call and acceptance of his leadership. So Jesus said, and this is in verse 19 and 20, and this is the last verses I'm going to go through tonight. It says, when he has gone a little further from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and went after him. Again, the immediate response 
is what Jesus' authority provoked. When after him, again, shows that, that picture of separation, that picture of giving all to him. And you think, you know, I was talking last week about like, like my life in sin. I, I had no problem committing to that. I had no problem giving all to that. So why is it such a struggle for us to give all to God? You know, I would go through any length I possibly could to get drunk, to get high, to get laid, whatever it was. Why is it so hard for me to give the same kind of commitment to follow God and do things that are life-giving and full of joy? Why would I try to, to hold back from doing that? Most of you guys are, are married. Guys, I mean, you guys are sitting right here in front of me. You guys are married. You think about it. How well would you wives react if you were like, okay, I'm going to commit to this new life with you Sunday mornings for about an hour and a half, and the rest of the week I'm going to sleep with other women. It's not going to work out very well. You know, what, suppose, suppose I get a new guitar, and, and I get this beautiful guitar, and I have the opportunity to make incredible music, to serve the kingdom with it, and it, it, to impact people's hearts and their minds on a powerful level. But instead, I, don't, I only play one string, and I just bounce back and forth between two notes. Like that. It's the same picture, just giving part of ourselves to God. William Booth, <coughs> excuse me, I still got a cold. <coughs> William Booth is the founder of the Salvation Army. Well, it started in England in the 1800s. And uh, he, he was at a ceremony being honored for, for what the Salvation Army had done. And Queen Victoria asked him, what's the secret to your ministry? Why is your ministry so effective? And he said, I, I guess it's because God has all of me. Not holding back, giving everything to him. What if, what if you go and buy a house and you purchase the house and say you've got 12 rooms in this house and the realtor goes, okay, here's, here's the title deed to this house you've got. It's a big place. It's going to be a big step for your family. It's going to, you can do wonderful things here. There's 12 rooms. I'm only going to give you the key to four of them. What are you going to do with that? Like, how pissed off would you be, right? You'd be like, I paid for the whole house. God paid for the whole house, man. We were bought at a price. We were bought at the ultimate price. To only give a portion of ourselves to God is to spit in the face to that, man. It's to look Christ in the cross in his eyes and spit in his face. And I do it sometimes the same as everybody else. I'm not trying to be all holier than thou with it, man. I fall too, and I need to evaluate myself and say, why am I sucking so bad at life right now? There is a story I read um, and you got to remember when, when you hear this that the Haitian legal system is much different than ours. There, this dude in Haiti wanted to sell his house for what was about $2,000 American, and he couldn't find someone that would pay the full price, so he sold it to someone for half price. The condition was that he retained ownership of one nail that stuck out from the main doorway into the house. So what happened is a couple years later, he hadn't been able to find a place to live, and he decides he wants his house back. He wants to buy his house back. The guy won't sell it to him. He's like, no, he sold it to me. He's like, well, I still own that one nail. So he kept hanging dead dogs on that one nail. Under Haitian law, he owns that nail, so the dude in the house couldn't take the dead dog down. So from the stink of the decaying flesh, eventually he had no choice but to leave the house. It wasn't inhabitable anymore. We leave Satan that one nail, man, to hang his rat stinking filth on? Our lives become an inhabitable place for Christ. That's with the death that he brings. There, um, Billy Graham. Most of you guys know who Billy Graham is. If you don't, we got Google, man. It's an awesome image. Billy Graham used to use this phrase, nailing your colors to the mast. And that came from the, the days of, of sailing and shipping. The ships would raise a flag up to the top of the mast. The color of the ship would indicate who they were, what they were doing, what the purpose was. Thing was, when they saw another ship, a lot of times what would happen is they would run to the mast and they would pull the flags down because they didn't know who was coming. They didn't know if it was an enemy. The enemy sees the color of their flag and goes, hey, that's one of the bad guys, and opens fire on them. So they would pull the flag down whenever there was an enemy coming. Billy Graham would say, use this phrase that came out of this, nail your flags to the mast. These dudes that were hardcore, that were fearless, just fearless in confidence about what they were doing, they nailed the flag to the mast so it couldn't be taken down. They were saying, I don't care. If you are going to come at me and you're going to try to blow me out of the water as you come over the horizon, that's up to you. This is where I'm going and this is my call and I'm committed to it. That's the, that's the attitude for spiritual warfare we need to have because we function in Christ's authority. We have his authority. Last thing I want to say, and then we'll play it for a little bit, um, is dude Dudley Ting. No one knows who Dudley Ting is. His name is Dudley Ting. Seriously. So Dudley Ting, well, his father was a Presbyterian pastor, um, and what we're talking about like early 1800s. His father retired from the church in the 1850s, and the church voted Dudley to be the new pastor. He was like uh, 27, 28 at the time. 
And it worked really well at first until he started preaching vehemently against slavery. The church didn't like that, so they wound up kicking him out of the church. He went and started another church, went very well. And he had a really good ministry. Um, he started these Bible studies that would go on at the YMCA every night. And God really put in his heart um, this, this strong desire to connect with uh, husbands and fathers. And he led a lot of men to Christ. He held this meeting. Um, this was, uh, it must have been like 1858, 1859 at this point. He held this meeting, and there were 5,000 men that showed up to this meeting. And he got up in front of them, and he said, I would rather have my right arm ripped off at the trunk than to fail in my duty to give you God's word. And he preached to these guys, and a thousand men came to Christ that day. So two weeks later, he's at a farm, and his shirt gets caught in the corn thresher and rips his right arm off pretty close to the trunk, severed the artery. They managed to keep him alive for, for a couple days, but he knew he was dying. And his father came in and said to his father, stand up for Jesus. No matter what comes, stand up for Jesus. And at his funeral, there was another pastor there who was so touched by the story that he wrote a poem, which became the hymn, Stand Up for Jesus, which was the hymn I was talking about that I turned into a rock song we're going to play tonight, but I'm still too sick at the same time. But anyways, the idea of that full commitment, giving everything, no matter what the cost, because the cost has already been paid for me to have the life I have now, the, the love, the peace, the joy, the fearless confidence, that price has been paid, so I owe God to give him everything. But I'm going to wrap this up. You guys want to come back up? play a few more songs, and then we'll call it a night. Um, I gotta bail out of here really quick tonight, because I gotta get Logan back to Vigo, so I'm not ditching you guys when I load up gear and run out of here. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the price that you paid. Jesus, we don't take for granted the things that you've done for us. We don't take for granted the life that you lived. We embrace that calling to live the life that you lived, to go out as the Father sent you to exercise your authority, to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to, to be an unshakable force of love and kindness and grace and forgiveness in a world that is everything but that. Pray that you'll shine the light into the darkness through us, God. In Jesus' name, amen.